Just so you guys, you can be turning to Revelation chapter 4. We're going to read the whole chapter. But as you're finding your place, just to tell you all a little bit about myself and my family um, and the connection to your pastor, um, I've known Sean since I was a 12-year-old boy. Um, he was my basketball coach in high school. And I can tell you this much, that man has mellowed out greatly as he ages. He cut his teeth in coaching with me and, and my high school friends, and we were, uh, he run us pretty hard, uh, to say the least. Um, my wife, Heather, who is sitting over here to my left, in front of Tyler and Savannah, we've been married for 15 years now. We have six beautiful children. Um, four of them are here with us, and she's had uh, two miscarriages throughout the years. Um, if you're wondering, my little boy's the one running around with a cast on his arm right now um, because of a uh, big sis pushing him down over here beside the, the gym and breaking his arm. Um, as Pastor said, I am the uh, kitchen director at Chick-fil-A in Lenore. We make a lot of chicken throughout the course of every day. If you've been by any Chick-fil-A, there's not a given time when our drive through is usually not wrapped around the building, it feels like. Um, to tell you a little bit about my personal testimony, I, I counted it up. The 23rd of September, I will be, have been saved 24 years. I was fortunate that the Lord saved me at a young age. Um, in all honesty, he called me to preach at a young age. But um, I am a natural introvert. And in high school, I would have took an F before I got up in front of a classroom and gave a speech of any type. Um, the Lord began to deal with me when I was about 16 years old to preach. And I run from that calling for a good while because there was no way that I would get up and speak in front of a congregation of any size. Um, then I surrendered a call to preach, and I've been preaching for roughly 12 years now. I attended seminary at West Lenore Baptist School of Ministry where I have a Master's in Divinity and recently graduated from, uh, it's called Tar Heel Leadership Institute right in Clemens, North Carolina, right out of uh, Winston-Salem. And here's what I can tell you with all the education I have. I don't know nothing. God's Word just gets deeper and more expansed as I age, um, a preacher that I like to listen to says that God's Word is shallow enough that the young Christian can wade in it, but God's Word is deep enough to drown the theologian. It just grows with time. Um, I am very passionate about His Word. His Word is what changes us. His Word is where we find our help and where we find our hope and comfort throughout the days of our life. Um, but with that being said, Revelation chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 11, and then uh, we will get started for the night. Uh, the author of the book of Revelation, as I'm sure you all know, is the Apostle John. He was on Patmos whenever God inspired him to write this very wonderful, but can be very challenging book to read. But it starts off and it tells us this. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it's, John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and a carnaline, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbling and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal, 
And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. There was a survey that was given to pastors and church members. And the survey was, out of all 66 books of Scripture, which one would you like to have heard preached through in a series? And that was what was given to the church members. The same question was given to pastors. Which book would you not? want to preach from if given the opportunity? The answer came back the same by almost 90%. 90% of church goers, the ones who sit on the pew and enjoy being taught from the scripture, said the book of Revelation. 90% of pastors said they would not want to preach from the book of Revelation. Well, why? When you get over further into the book, you have the scene where a pit opens and these creatures come out with the face of a lion and the tail of a scorpion, and what is, what's that about? And even the passage that we just read, what are, what are these creatures that look like a, a lion and a, a man and an eagle and an ox? What, what, what is being said here? People try to correlate it with, well, those those creatures out of that pit, that, that, that's probably going to be helicopters. Things of, things of that nature is the stuff that comes out. But when we read the book of Revelation, and we understand that what is really being said and being portrayed is the glory of the coming King. That Christ is coming, and He is coming with all glory and honor, and all of heaven is coming with Him. That changes the way that you look at this book. Whenever you look through Scripture, the word throne is used 67 times. Over 40 of those times is out of the book of Revelation. Nearly every chapter references this throne that is the centerpiece of heaven. So one of the basic rules of interpretation when we read our Bibles is if it's in God's Word, it matters. But when it begins to repeat something, God is trying to say something to us. He is really saying, I'm repeating myself here. We need to listen to what's being said. Just in this book or this chapter 4 here that we're about to work through, the word throne is used somewhere between 12 to 14 times. I think God's trying to tell us something about what's going on in heaven and who is the one that sits on the throne. But with that being said, what I want to speak on is this thought of reasons for worship. When we look around and we look at our current climate in the world, and I could ask you and say, who has something going on in their life right now? Who's struggling with something? There probably wouldn't be a single hand that would not be raised. We get so caught up in what's going on in our lives, whether it's, it's sickness, whether it's circumstances out of our control, just pull up to a gas pump. You'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, we can almost lose sight in the fact that we still have reasons to worship our king who sits on the throne. And when we look to the book, this chapter, 
God is trying to tell us and give us reasons to worship Him despite what our circumstances are. And so he starts and he says in verse 1, After this I looked, and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, which you could see he's referencing back to chapter 1 and verse 1, or in the vicinity there, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. And then he says in verse 2, And at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. So here's reason number one for worship. There is a throne in heaven. The king that we worship does not sit in the White House. He does not even sit in some earthly kingdom in a castle. The king we worship sits in the center of the universe. He is the pinnacle of all the created realm. And just because things wouldn't go our way in a particular election or things of that nature, things may not be going particularly right in our lives, does not mean that the kings come off the throne. We can worship because there is a king in heaven. This vision that John has here of the one on the throne is very similar to the one that the prophet Isaiah has in Isaiah chapter 6. If you'll remember there, it says in the year that the king Uzziah died, Isaiah goes on to say that I saw the king, I saw God high and lifted up. And he begins to talk about the vestige of his robe, which has to do with his regal royalty. We can just simply worship God tonight if there was no other reason that he is the king on the throne. And there is none other like him. But then look what he says. He goes on and he tells us this in verse 3. And he who sat on the throne had the appearance of jasper and carnaline, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Now we've been through, seems like a very rough weather pattern. Storms popping up almost every evening. A lot of lightning going around and things of that nature. But usually what comes on the backside of a storm? A rainbow. Usually a rainbow has uh, different colors, blues and yellows and purples and things of that nature. But notice what it says about this particular rainbow that is completely encircling the throne that's in heaven. It says it's emerald in color. And when you read things in Scripture, everything has a, a reason. There's a symbol, there's something about it. So whenever he says here that this particular rainbow, it, don't, it ain't like the rainbow that we would see in the sky in all its colors. It says it's green, or the color of emerald, which is a greenish color. Do you know what green represents in Scripture? Grace. In the midst of the throne where the one who sits on the pinnacle of the universe is encircled with a rainbow that constantly reminds God of the grace that he's extended to man through his son on the cross. We can worship him because of the grace that's been extended to us. I did nothing deserving. There was nothing about this young man when the Lord saved me to be deserving of salvation. There's nothing good about me. I have plenty of bad traits. You can ask my beloved bride afterwards. She will happily fill you in on it, most of them. I was born a sinner. David tells us in the book of Psalms that in iniquity did my mother conceive me. We are born sinners. I can tell you that my family comes from my dad was a alcoholic. To the point that he kept a bottle of alcohol, hard liquor, he run a motor for Bernhardt for about 20 years, and when it'd be time to clean out the exhaust vents and get all that sawdust out of there, he had a bottle of liquor that he kept under there that he would happily, needless to say that that exhaust got cleaned out pretty regularly on a daily basis. Um, 
but the Lord marvelously saved him. And I grew up in a preacher's home. My, my dad has preached for many years. And, but that gave me no merit as far as God is concerned. I was just a wicked sinner who was in need of marvelous grace. And thank the Lord that grace extends from the throne of heaven. But look what else he tells us. If we go on and he says in verse 4, he says, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the throne were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. Well, who are these individuals? Who are these 24 elders? There's lots of speculation, but what I believe it to be is how many tribes of Israel were there in the Old Testament? 12. How many apostles were there? 12. You guys know your Bible very good. If you have the 12 tribes of Israel, then you have the 12 apostles, that equals 24. What I believe is being represented here in the number 24 is all of the redeemed throughout the ages are represented by these 24 elders on these 24 smaller thrones. Because it talks about their garments being white, which is a sign of their redemption. Whenever you read, if you go back to um, chapter 1 and 2, and it talks about those seven churches, there's evidence that the fact that they are saved is it talks about them receiving a white garment. Here, these 24 elders have those garments on. So not only do we worship our king because he is king and king alone and is deserving of our worship, we worship him for his grace, but we worship him for redemption. Thank the Lord that he sent his son to be our substitute. The substitutionary atonement of Christ on Calvary's tree, and the shed blood of the perfect, spotless Son of God is what purchased your redemption and mine. And despite what's going on all around us, we can worship Him because of the salvation He has provided us through His Son. But then look what it tells us. It says in verse 5, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. So when he's referencing the flashes of lightning and the rumbles of thunder, if you go back to the book of Exodus, this is similar to what happened when God gave the law on Mount Sinai. It talks about when God's presence settled on that mountain to not even let your animals touch it lest they die. When God give his law, it is semblance of justice. And here's the idea. We can worship him because of the justice that will come to this world. We see and we think of the atrocities of the Holocaust. And all of the things that we see all over the news of the shootings that happens at school and all the innocent lives that are shed that way. We think of the atrocity of all the lives that have been lost through abortion. Whether they answer to a court here on earth or not for these things, it will stand before God in heaven. There will be justice at the end of it all for the ones who did things that are wicked that we would say that's not fair, they're getting away with it. Eventually they will meet perfect justice. <coughs> we can thank him for this justice because we can trust him in the fact that he will make all things right in the end. But also, I want you to think of this also. If here we see a similarity of justice, 
in the fact of similitudes between the law given on Mount Sinai and what we see here in the lightnings and the thunder. What about his grace that we just mentioned? Where do you think in Scripture it talks about God's grace and his justice meeting? Would that not have took place on Calvary's tree? Listen to what Psalms tells us. Psalms 85.10 tells us this. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. You have to appreciate the wrath of the storm to appreciate the beauty of the rainbow. If it was not for God's law and showing us how wicked we really are and how severe our sin really is in his nostrils. Scripture tells us that our sin stenches in the nostrils of God. If we cannot appreciate the sincerity and severity of the law and what its, its payment is if we break it, which is death, then we cannot really appreciate the beauty of the cross. We have to understand one to appreciate the beauty of the other. God giving his law to us is in all honesty his grace towards us. And what I mean by that is what is his law? His law is a representation of his character and his standards. Without the law, without the Ten Commandments, which is what I'm referencing, if he had never gave them to Moses on Mount Sinai, we would have never known the standard. Paul tells us that the law was his school teacher. And when we understand the law and we understand that that is God's character revealed to us, who can meet that? Who can meet that standard? None of us can. It's, you know, it's an impossible standard to hold to. But thank the Lord he sent one who could keep it and fulfill every bit of it. And that was his precious son. And so we can thank him for his justice. Well, then look what it tells us in verse 6. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. He referenced this sea of glass. Um, that's probably going to have the idea of like, there ain't a whole lot of waves in this sea. Perfect and calm and still. Now, if you were to think of the current climate of this world, it ain't perfect, calm, and still, is it? You hear about China's mad just because a, a lady goes and, and gets on a plane and goes to Taiwan, and now they're ready to go to war. It, it's, it's a totemous environment. It's, it's like the sea, where you go out and you just see the waves crashing. Now, it's nice to go look at the ocean. That's kind of peaceful. But our world is anything but calm from our perspective. But from the perspective of the throne, we need to understand that everything is according, according to his perfect plan. We need to understand that our Lord and Savior had checkmate in sight when he created it all. There's nothing that's taken him by surprise this very moment. There's nothing going on that he's up there wrenching his hands over, scratching his head, saying, well, I didn't see that coming. He is the sovereign one who sits on the throne of all creation. Everything in this world is going according to his perfect plan. We can worship him in that. But then look what it tells us. It goes on and it says at the bottom of verse 5, From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Question. Don't we believe that God is Trinitarian in his existence? 
And what I mean by Trinitarian is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What does John here mean by these seven spirits of God? Well, you have to go back to the book of Isaiah. You read Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. It talks about what it's going to look like for that coming promised Messiah. And it gives seven attributes of what he's going to have when he comes. What it is saying is, is basically this is what the Holy Spirit is going to look like working through the promised Messiah. What is being said here literally is we can worship and thank God for his Holy Spirit. Because if it was not for his Holy Spirit, none of us would be saved. And what I mean by that is, who was the one that come by your way the day you got saved? Was it not the Holy Spirit coming to you and telling you of the goodness of the Father? And how desperately wicked I was, and how desperately wicked we all are, and how desperately we need a Savior. That was the Holy Spirit that done that. We worship Him because He sent the Holy Spirit to do that for us. But then it goes on and it tells us this. It begins at the end of verse 6, speaking of these living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. And it says in verse 7, The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. Two possibilities here of what this means. First, you think of this. It says the first living creature is like a lion. Well, what's the lion known as? The king of what? He's the king of the jungle, right? Then it speaks of the ox. Well, the ox, uh, you hear the terminology, that boy is as strong as an ox. You have the, the, the king of the jungle, the ox, which would represent the, the king of the working class animals. And then you have the third creature who says he has a face like a man. Well, man, in all reality, is God's crowning jewel in his creation. And then finally, you have the fourth creature who looks like an eagle, has the face of an eagle, which would represent, I mean, what cooler bird is there than an eagle? Whenever you can go up to Lake James and places like that, even here in western North Carolina, and see one swoop down and grab a fish with those big long talons and fly off up in a tree and have his dinner, so to speak, what, what's much cooler, what's, what's more grander of a bird than an eagle? So this could possibly be representing all of the created realm worshiping in the throne room of heaven. There's also another possibility. The lion. How is Jesus revealed in Matthew? He is the lion of the tribe of what? Judah. Matthew reveals Christ as king. The book of Mark. What does Mark reveal Christ as? Well, I can tell you what he's revealed as. He's revealed as the servant in the book of Mark. The ox. The epitome of the working class. You, re you can read the book of Mark and get tired. Because he's constantly... And he did this. And he did that. And then he went here and did this. That's the, the book of Mark is completely full of what Jesus was doing in serving other people. How is Christ revealed in Luke? Do you know what Christ's favorite self-designation for himself is in the book of Luke? The Son of Man. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And then finally, the eagle. How is Christ revealed in the book of John? In Luke, he's revealed as the Son of Man. In the book of John, he's revealed as the Son of God. Nothing, there's no 
better designation than being the Son of God. So either John is trying to say that you have the, all of the created realm here worshiping, or it could be revealing the designations of Christ as revealed in the Gospels. And then in, if that is the case, then we worship our Lord for the Gospel. The Gospel extends from the throne of heaven. But then not only that, look what else it tells us. It says in verse 8, it says, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. Now a lot of times you'll hear, we worship God for his salvation which we should. We worship God and we thank Him for His grace, which we should. But when's the last time we perceived the thought of worshiping Him just because He's holy? He is the thrice holy God. And it is no way possible that we could walk into His presence without facing utter obliviation because of His sheer holiness. But because of what the Son did on Calvary, we can have access to the thrice holy God. Holy just means other than. He is set apart. In the Old Testament, it tells us, God says, As the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above yours. God don't operate like we do. He is different than we are. And thank God for that. But when is the last time we just recognized him for his holiness? That when anyone or anything that has come into the presence of his holiness has either fell over dead, actually, or fell over dead in the appearance because of falling down on their face in his presence. And because of what the Son did on Calvary, we can come into his presence. As it tells us in the book of Hebrews, when it tells us to come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. The only reason we have that access is because of the Son. There is one thing about my my preaching that I really try to get the point of cross. If you don't like hearing about Jesus, you're not going to like hearing me speak. Because if we're not coming for Jesus and to hear about what he's done, then you, you were coming for the wrong reasons. Because if it was not for Christ and his atoning work on Calvary, where would we be this very moment? We can talk about politics and they come up in sermons from time to time. They make good illustrations. But at the end of the day, the whole purpose of any of this is to talk about the one who died for us. And so it goes on and it tells us this. He says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That is talking about him being the all-powerful one. The, 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 The big word for it is he's omnipotent. He has all the power in this world. No one else. He is the all-powerful, almighty God. When you think of this creation that is so beautifully made, the fact that he made it just by the power of his word, he speaks and things come into existence. Nothing else has that type of power. And he has all the power in this world. If he was 99.9% almighty and something else had that one-tenth of a percent, he's not God. He is the Almighty One who sits on the throne of heaven. But then it goes on and it tells us in verse 9, And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Now here, I love good music. 
the music that we and my family have been able to enjoy since we've been back here. Um, just so y'all know a little bit about me over the last few years, I just recently resigned from a church in Morganton where I was the pastor for about three years. And I just felt like it was, the Lord was saying, telling me I was, I was done. But the music, this will all make, I'm getting to a point. The music that I have enjoyed here has been phenomenal. And what I love about it is the fact that it has some Bible to back it up. Even the music is theologically sound. There is a song, I remember heard it as, hearing it as a kid, um, saying, I'm going to take my crown and walk around glory land, and can remember hearing and seeing groups sing that song twirling like there was an imaginary crown on their finger. That is the epitome of arrogance. And what do I mean by that? We're not going to take a single crown that we earn in this world and carry it anywhere but to the feet of the one who died for us. He is the one that is worthy of all honor and glory and praise. The book of Philippians tells us simply this, that he is the one that is working in us to the will and do of his good pleasure. Any good work that we could ever possibly do on this earth is because of the Holy Spirit in us, working through us. And the only reason that that is possible because of what happened on Calvary. We will cast the crowns at his feet. But then in verse 11 it says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And by your will, they existed and were created. A lot of what was said here tonight is this. This is just some application and it will be done. A lot of times we worship for what God is doing for us. Does that make sense? Yes, he saved us and we should worship him for that. But in all honesty, there's sometimes we go through valleys so deep and there's so much struggle and so much heartache that we're going through in the moment that it can appear that heaven is silent. That heaven is doing nothing. We know better. And why do we know better? Because of Scripture. But I know I'm not the only one that's ever felt that way in my life since being saved. But... A lot of the stuff that's mentioned here tonight is simply who God is. He is omnipotent. We receive grace from him because he is the epitome and picture of what grace is. A lot of the things that are mentioned here in this passage are simply the things that God is. Over what he does. And when we learn to worship him... Not only for what he does, but when we learn to worship him simply for who he is, that transcends circumstances. When we worship God just simply for being the one on the throne, we can worship that in any given circumstance and situation. Whenever we learn to worship him just because he is holy, he never stops being holy no matter what's going on in our lives. Then we worship him regardless of the situation. And whenever we can learn to worship God, not only for what he does, but even more so just simply for who he is, that will transcend space and time. That transcends anything, any struggle that we're going through in our lives. So with that being said, thank you so much for your attentiveness tonight. Um, and I will dismiss us with prayer. The most good and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, God, we thank you for your word, and Lord, how we can look to it to learn who you are. And when we learn who you are as revealed in Scripture, then we learn to worship you as you intended us to. And God, I ask that you would take what is...
said here by the Apostle John. And Lord, and open our eyes that we may see wonderful things out of your word. And Father, we thank you for your Son and your goodness and your grace. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.